focus on what matters. Welcome to the Path Forward for Innovation in the Early Detection of Cancer, an Axios virtual event. I'm Caitlin Owens, a healthcare reporter for Axios, and I'm joining you from our headquarters in Arlington, Virginia. Welcome to our audiences on Facebook, YouTube, Twitter, LinkedIn, and Axios.com. If you'd like to join our conversation today on Twitter, you can do so at, at Axios and hashtag Axios events. Over the next 30 minutes, I'll be joined by my colleague, Sam Baker, and we'll discuss innovations in care for cancer prevention and treatment. Our first guest is the Congresswoman from Alabama, Representative Terry Sewell, and she's joining us from Washington, D.C. Welcome, Congresswoman. Thanks so much, Caitlin. Look forward to having our discussion about health care. So today we're talking about early cancer detection, uh, which has always been a very important subject. Can you talk a little bit about how the pandemic has amplified the importance of early cancer detection? Absolutely. You know, the past two years have been like no other uh, with this global threat and the COVID-19 pandemic. Um, But the COVID-19 really has laid bare, put a spotlight on systemic uh, disinvestments in healthcare and health disparities uh, in this country. We didn't need a pandemic to tell us about health disparities, but one of the biggest disparities is in cancer. Um, And we all know that early detection matters. And so um, I think that uh, the fact that this pandemic has really put a focus on public health has been, um, you know, has made the health disparity issue and the equity issue around healthcare much more, um, brought it much more to the forefront. Right. And I mean, another giant um, kind of defining element of the pandemic was that a lot of preventative care either got delayed or skipped altogether. Um, I mean, so how concerned are you that some of this early cancer detection may just not have happened over the past year and a half? Well, I'm very concerned about it. You know, I represent a district high in Alabama that is the poorest district in the state of Alabama with um, the largest incidences of of um, a lot of pre-existing conditions, whether it's diabetes or obesity or um, hypertension. And so I just heard from lots of my constituents that they were deferring getting their mammograms, uh, which also means that that means people are not getting those those cancers that that are, um, you know, that that do have screening uh, available, uh, getting those tested. You know, there's only screening for five types of cancers and 600,000 people die from cancer every year. Um, Just this past year, I lost my mother to pancreatic cancer and pancreatic cancer happens to be one of those cancers that without, you know, it's often just um, diagnosed very late. And so it's that late diagnosis that means that um, that most of the time the cancer has metastasized. Uh, Even before my mom got sick, I was carrying the seminal piece of legislation um, around early detection. Um, There's lots of, um, you know, companies now that are coming out with these blood, simple blood tests that will allow uh, for screening of 50 different kinds of cancers. And so my bill, the, um, Medi- the um, Medicare Multi-Cancer Early Detection Screening Act, um, would give us an opportunity um, to modernize uh, the Medicare coverage to enable providers and seniors to have access to new tests uh, using a simple blood draw. Um, and you know, being able to screen for more than 50 types of cancers, including pancreatic cancer. Uh, Clearly right now it's in the developmental stage. Actually, um, several uh, of these tests are are up for FDA approval right now. And it takes decades after FDA approval to get Medicare to actually cover it. And we know that time, um, that time means loss of lives. Um, The more time that it takes means more people are are dying. And so um, I am really eager to try to make sure that uh, as we are getting, as these tests are being developed and approved by the FDA, that they're also covered by uh, Medicare. Right, right. And and I'm sorry for your loss. Thank you for sharing that with us today. Um, But, you know, your legislation, it's it's pretty specific, um, but it also kind of gets at this fascinating area of emerging technology, um, especially in the healthcare space. And, you know, to your point, yeah, uh, bureaucracy and policy often does not keep up with this technology. 
Um, but can you just tell us a little bit about some of the things that are in development that you're excited for in this uh, cancer detection space? Yeah, I'm excited about the fact that, um, you know, that just drawing blood um, and having a blood sample being able to diagnose uh, across a, a myriad of types of cancers just from a simple uh, blood test, um, those are exciting to me. I, I also know that when we put our minds to it, we can take the hardest of cancers and find screens and, and find, you know, therapies. I think about the fact that colon cancer used to be a kiss of death. And now we, because of screening, um, have brought the numbers of people who die from that cancer down. Um, I'd like for that to be the case with pancreatic cancer and have really tried to um, make it my, my life's work here in Congress to try to provide more uh, research dollars at NIH and, 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 and in private research to try to figure out ways that we can get um, early detection screenings for lots of the, 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 um, the cancers right now that, that so often um, when they're detected, are detected later in the stage and it becomes almost impossible to find, you know, these therapies to find ways to manage it, let alone to find a cure for some of them. Right, right. And I know we're talking about a specific issue today, but um, it has a lot of ties into broader healthcare issues, such as access to care, um, specifically access to preventative care, um, health disparities. Um, Democrats are working on a giant piece of legislation right now, the Build Back Better Act. Um, will that touch on, you know, via these large, larger channels? Will this, if that legislation passes, will that affect cancer detection at all? Well, yeah. I mean, to the extent that uh, part of the Build Back Better um, bill right now has, um, you know, extends a lot of these um, expanded um, premium tax credits, which would allow coverage. Um, healthcare coverage for folks who currently don't have it. You know, for me as a state, Alabama did not expand Medicaid. It was really important for me and uh, as a priority within Build Back Better that we actually uh, make permanent these extended, um, you know, uh, premium uh, tax credits so that more folks in Alabama and across this nation uh, have uh, an ability to get covered. Um, and so this Medicaid coverage gap uh, closing that has become an equity issue. Um, 30,000, actually 300,000 Alabamians currently fall in that gap. And what that gap is, is that they're working, they're the working poor. Um, folks that make too much money to be on Medicaid in my state, but, you know, but uh, make, uh, don't make enough money that they can afford, afford their own health insurance. So because early detection for cancer is so critically important and because of preventive care, would actually save us a lot of money on the, on the back end. I think that the more people we can get covered and the more people that we can get um, healthcare coverage and access to quality, affordable healthcare, the more we can detect earlier, we can detect um, these, uh, these uh, cancers and save lives. Right, right. Now, we're talking about cancer detection. Um, I don't want to neglect cancer prevention. You know, once you're detecting cancer, you already have a problem in that um, it's there. Can you talk a little bit about how some of these um, disparities and equity issues extend to cancer prevention? Uh, sure. You know, since um, some of the cancers, uh, some of the indices for cancer um, uh, deal directly with diabetes and with hypertension and other things that uh, may be early signs um, that could help us prevent uh, cancers down the, down the way, I think it's really important that we, um, you know, spend the money on the front end and trying to prevent uh, some of these um, early, um, you know, early uh, chronic illnesses that often lead to cancer. Um, and so I think that if we can get people, if we can actually do a more holistic approach and try to get, um, you know, catch some of these diseases on the front end by preventing, um, you know, hypertension and by preventing diabetes and obesity and other things, and really focus on wellness, I think that it would go a long way um, in decreasing the, 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 the um, incidences of death uh, from cancer, as well as um, help us maybe to, to, to detect them earlier. Um, you know, my bill is just one bill, and um, the, the Ways and Means Committee has jurisdiction over Medicare, which is why I'm focused pretty much on, on Medicare. And I do know that so many of these cancers come later in life. Um, and right. so I think that if we can figure out a way 
that we can get better screening and then make them more accessible to um, those groups that are more vulnerable to having these kinds of um, cancers, then I think that we will save lives. And I think that that's, that's the point and that's why I think it's so important that we, um, as these uh, you know, as these therapies and as these tests are being developed and are going through the FDA process, let's not wait until we actually have them on the market and then try to make uh, Medicare, Medicaid cover them. Let's try to do it on the front end because it will save lives by doing the early detection and, to, and by providing screening. So we'd like to end these events with one fun thing. Um, as everyone may or may not have forgotten, we have a holiday next week. Um, and a little birdie has told me that you might have um, quite a busy time in the kitchen for preparing for Thanksgiving. Do you want to tell us a little bit I about am. your meal prep plans? <laughs> I am. You know, I, um, I have very fond memories of helping my mom uh, prepare Thanksgiving dinner. Um, but since her loss, this will be the first Thanksgiving that we have without her. And I have the task of doing her sweet potato pies. And let's just say that even though I served as a sous chef to my mom uh, over the last, uh, you know, decades of, of her cooking Thanksgiving dinner, I didn't really pay that much attention to what she was putting in it. So um, I had an opportunity to go back home to Selma and to find my mom's old cookbooks. And I even took the pans, hoping that God, by you know, by some miracle, by using exactly the, the same blender, <laughs> the same pot and pan, that I can somehow recreate her dishes. Um, so wish me luck. Uh, just know that um, that uh, I also have a contingency plan. It's called uh, Patty LaBelle's Sweet Potato Pies. <laughs> <laughs> I may well, be, uh, so I may be getting, well, I've ordered some, put them in the freezer just in case mine don't turn out that great. I may be whipping out a, a really beautiful sweet potato pie that was made by somebody else. <laughs> I mean, it's always great to have a backup plan. I'm with you there. Absolutely. Plan B. <laughs> Well, good luck with your pies, and I hope you have a wonderful Thanksgiving, um, and thank you for joining Axios today. Absolutely. Thank you so much, and have, happy Thanksgiving. Next, we have a view from the top segment with my colleague, Vice President of Growth at Axios, Mia Vallow. Thanks, Caitlin. And thank you to our sponsor, Prevent Cancer Foundation, for making this conversation possible. Now, joining us from Alexandria, Virginia, is President and COO of the Prevent Cancer Foundation, Jody Hoyos. Hi, Jody. Thanks for joining us today. Hi, Mia. Thank you. It's wonderful to be here. Jody, as we commemorate the National Cancer Act's 50th anniversary, can you tell us a little about the Prevent Cancer Foundation and the work that you're doing to support America's war on cancer? I'm happy to do that. It's in a, really an incredible time of innovation at the foundation and in the war on cancer. Our mission at the foundation is saving lives across all populations through cancer prevention and early detection. The CEO and founder of the organization, Bo Aldege, started the foundation 36 years ago after her father died of a preventable cancer. So we've been around for a large part of the 50-year war on cancer. Um, following the, the death of Bo's father, she looked around at different organizations and initiatives and found that they were all focused on treatment and cures and realized that we really needed to have a seat at the table for prevention and early detection. The voice is critically important because as we know, uh, when cancers are detected early, it increases people's chances for survival. And of course, preventing cancers altogether would be the most ideal future vision. So to this day, we remain steadfast in the dedication to cancer prevention, early detection, and we do that through research, uh, we fund research, we provide education about risks and options to people in all communities. We provide outreach to communities in culturally appropriate ways through local partnerships. And we advocate for policy initiatives that support funding for and access to cancer prevention and early detection. So the Prevent Cancer Foundation is a critical player in the war on cancer because we, um, we represent the very beginning of the story. We have a very unique position in being able to look across all different cancer types and look at the whole person. So we can convene and bring together people of all different disciplines to look at where we have gaps and challenges uh, in cancer prevention and early detection, and we can learn from each other. Thank you for sharing that. The U.S. saw another record-breaking one-year drop in cancer deaths. What are some of the innovations in cancer prevention and early detection 
that have contributed to this decline. You know, what also is remarkable that 50% of cancer deaths are considered preventable. So, but you know, there's a lot of good news to celebrate and we still have work to do. Uh, we've seen a decline in cancer death rates since 1991 in large part due to fewer people smoking. But it's also due to advances in early detection and treatment, as well as vaccinations and treatments for viruses that are linked to cancer. So for colon cancer, we have colonoscopies, and now we have stool-based testing that people can do at home. Cervical cancer is almost 100% preventable through screening and the human papillomavirus vaccine. And that HPV vaccine can also prevent five other types of cancer. And we can also detect cancers early with mammograms and low-dose CT uh, scans for lung cancer screening. And lung cancer screening is significantly underutilized right now, but it's a powerful tool for saving lives. Now, many healthcare professionals fear that the pandemic will continue to prevent patients from receiving cancer screenings and worsen disparities in access to innovative care, which could ultimately lead to a decrease in early detection and a rise in cancer deaths. How has the pandemic created setbacks for cancer screenings? It's been a tough two years. You know, we've seen nearly two years of missed doctor's appointments and, and medical screenings, including routine cancer screenings and vaccinations. So last year, we launched the Back on the Books campaign, which urges individuals to reschedule their cancer screenings and other routine health appointments. Um, a survey that we did found that nearly one half of all adults had, uh, that had appointments scheduled missed or postponed that appointment. So you had one in six women miss their annual mammograms and nearly one in seven that missed their PAP or HPV test. Um, and unfortunately, children are also at risk because more than a quarter of parents say that they have missed their children's scheduled vaccinations, including the HPV vaccine. And the challenge with that is that people from minority groups are most likely, most likely to have had to miss their appointment, which really further exacerbates the disparities that you were asking about. But I don't want to end the response on that note. I, I do want to note that there is significant hope on the horizon. So people can and they should reschedule those appointments and get them back on the books. And this is an incredibly exciting time for innovation um, and cancer screening in particular. These innovations have the potential to be centered around people and really address the barriers that are preventing people from getting their cancer screening. And uh, one particular area where we see a lot of potential is in multi-cancer early detection tests. Those tests could enable us to screen for many more types of cancer. Right now, we only have routine screenings for five types of cancer. So we wanna make sure that once these tests are approved by the FDA, that they can be considered for Medicare coverage. And that would be done by the Medicare Multi-Cancer Early Detection Screening Coverage Act of 2021. So we're really focused on seeing that legislation move forward. My last question to you is, looking forward to this next chapter in the war on cancer, what new strategies are in development for cancer prevention and screening? So I'll wrap that up pretty quickly and say that based on our survey, we had 32% of uh, Americans are not even aware of which screenings they should be getting. So to start, we need to educate the public on what screenings are recommended for them. That's a big piece. The second is the continued innovation and continue to move it forward. The new developments like blood-based cancer screening, multi-cancer screening tests could really be a game changer. There is no routine screening for the vast majority of cancers and not enough people are using the cancer screenings we already have. So expanding the screenings available to people and increasing the uptake of existing, existing screenings would be key in creating a world where no one dies of cancer. And the, the Prevent Cancer Foundation is very committed to leading the way in this vision of a world where no one dies of cancer. Thank you again, Jody, for joining us today and sharing the great work that you and the team at Prevent Cancer Foundation are doing. Oh, you're welcome. My pleasure. Thank you for having us. Now over to my colleague, Sam Baker. Thanks, Mia. I'm Sam Baker. I'm a senior editor at Axios, uh, and I am joined today as our, our final guest by Dr. Ned Sharpless, the director of the National Cancer Institute. Dr. Sharpless, thanks so much for taking the time to be with us. Good morning, thank you for having me. So I've heard you say a couple of times that we are in a, a golden age of cancer research. I wonder if you could sort of 
define that for us. What is it that is happening now? What is the stage that we are in uh, that in the future we'll look back and, and see this as a new? Sure. We're, 50 years ago, in 1971, uh, the nation passed the National Cancer Act, which really created more funding for cancer research. It sort of changed how we think about cancer as a nation, but it also created some really important infrastructure for cancer research, you know, national labs and, and used databases, for example. And now we've built on that success over decades to really have a very good understanding of the sort of molecular biology of the cancer, what makes a cancer cell tick. And and, and now I'd say today that we know what we don't know about cancer. We, we know where the problems still are. We know where we need a better understanding of cancer to make further progress. And so that, that, that you know, decades of basic science work makes possible uh, rapid progress against cancer. We're already starting to see this in terms of declining mortality and really important advances against diseases like non-small cell lung cancer and melanoma. So I, I think we will come to see this period we're living in right now as this golden period for cancer research, where we made the kind of progress against cancer over a few, you know, over a short, relatively short period of time that we saw like with antibiotics in the early 20th century against infectious disease. And uh, so it's really a great time in cancer research in terms of the new ideas, and the new therapies all coming to benefit patients. But I think it's also important to state we have a long way to go. We still have 600,000 Americans dying of cancer in the United States. Cancer is still extraordinarily expensive for our society and it's still, in many ways, a very tragic illness for most of our patients. So we have made terrific progress and are continuing to make terrific progress, but still a long ways to go. So some of that progress, I think we know is attributable to the United States has done uh, pretty well on some prevention other measures, uh, excuse me, like tobacco cessation, not so well on others like obesity. Um, obviously, early screening is, is also part of the equation. Once a patient goes in for that screening, can you sort of give us a, a bird's eye layman's view? What, what is the, the, the science that is working on that patient's behalf now that wasn't there, maybe not 50 years ago, but just 10 or 15 years ago? Uh, and, and what do you think will be there 10 or 15 years from now that may not be there just yet? Sure. As you point out, you know, if you look at what's caused that mortality decline, it's lots of things because cancer is lots of diseases. And so you don't make progress. There's no sort of silver bullet for cancer. There are lots of things that work on reducing mortality. And so you mentioned tobacco control, which has been a real sort of public health success, although we still have too many Americans smoking in the United States. But another, I think, important success that's had an impact on cancer mortality has been the advent of successful screening for certain kinds of cancers like breast cancer, through mammography or colon cancer, through a colonoscopy and other measures, a cervical cancer through pap smears, and now most recently lung cancer through a low-dose CT screening, a lot of CAT scans of the lung. And those uh, methods work, uh, but we have lots of cancers for which we don't have approved uh, screening measures yet, at, which I think is a further opportunity. I think that there's these new technologies developing that will allow for more and more patients to benefit from screening. Early detection of cancer is very desirable because it allows you to treat it at a stage when the therapies are not so toxic and you can really cure patients. So expanding screening through new technologies like blood tests that you could do in healthy individuals to find a, a variety of cancers would be a really important advance. I think another important thing to say about cancer screening is it is in many ways a success story of modern cancer care, but we don't reach enough patients. There's still many, many patients who are not undergoing screening, who are eligible screening, and we're not reaching for whatever reason. Uh, the pandemic has only made this worse. And so, you know, getting everyone in for screening who, who needs screening is still a top priority for the National Cancer Institute. And I, I want to pick up on, on two of the, the things you've mentioned here. Uh, one, you know, you mentioned, obviously, there's a lot of cancers that we have not made quite as much progress on. Uh, you also said we're in a, in a phase where we sort of know what we don't know. Do you see sort of even if we're not there yet, are we in a place where with some of these, you know, very difficult, hard to detect cancers like pancreatic cancer, are the seeds there? Like, could you identify what they are that in at a certain point down the road, we're going to make big progress against these more stubborn cancers? Or are we still sort of waiting for a breakthrough that we don't know quite what it is? You know, it, it's hard to predict the, this. Uh, I think, um, you know, pancreatic cancer, as you mentioned, is a disease that's hard to detect early. We don't really have a screening for it, and it's hard to treat once it happens. So we don't really have curative measures in, in for the majority of patients that, that develop that cancer. I think there are a number of promising ideas about how to either detect pancreatic cancer earlier or about how to uh, treat it at later stages. 
many of these are very exciting. I can't say today which one of these is is, is uh, likely to most most likely to benefit patients in the future. But I can tell you the story of metastatic melanoma. You know, melanoma at one point, not long ago, was about one of the worst cancers imaginable in a metastatic setting. It was uniformly lethal for patients once it advanced. And uh, now, uh, you know, a decade later, after, because of the remarkable development of several new therapies for melanoma, it's a disease we cure in the majority of patients, you know, maybe as many as 70% or more. So that, that shows you how quickly it can happen. Once you have a, a new idea or a new paradigm or a new approach to the disease, you know, you can go from a, a, a very, very uh, bad cancer to a cancer with a much better prognosis uh, in a short order. And so I, I am optimistic we will see that kind of progress for things like pancreatic cancer and brain cancer and other tumors where, you know, progress is lagged, where we still have a ways to go. And, you know, from your perspective, from the, from the work that NCI does, uh, to what extent are sort of the challenges of early detection and the challenges of treatment uh, scientifically related? That is, does, does progress on a better tool in one, obviously, early detection helps treatment because it's better to catch cancer early, but, but you know, sort of in the lab and in the, the, the science that you're working on, does one trickle over to the other? Yeah, I think for early detection, we, there, there are at least two areas where uh, that I, I think about where we need more progress. So one is, as I mentioned, we have these effective therapies for a handful of malignants, uh, effective screening measures, rather, for a handful of cancers. But we need to expand that to lots of other kinds of cancers. So we need new technologies, be these blood-based screening assays or better imaging, maybe using artificial intelligence to look at you know, CAT scans of the pancreas, for example. Or, you know, so so there, there, I believe there are new methodologies that we could use to enhance screening uh, to make it uh, more successful for the cancers where we don't have good screening presently. But the other thing I very much worry about is, is how do we get screening into all the patients who need it? And this is an interesting scientific question. So we, we have therapies that we know work, but yet their dissemination and implementation in a community setting is often challenging. A good example of this now is lung cancer screening. We know that's effective for certain kinds of individuals, particularly individuals who have a history of smoking a significant amount. Uh, but the uptake of lung cancer screening nationally is, is very poor. It's on the order of, you know, less than 10% of eligible patients are screened. So, you know, the science is, in terms of the benefit of it, is established. It's compelling. But yet the adoption, you know, the barriers to adoption, we still don't fully understand. And this is an important research question. The NCI really has to fund the science to understand what these barriers are and how we can dismantle them so that more patients can benefit from that. And the pandemic has made things quite a bit worse on the screening front. Correct? No doubt. Yes. Uh, we saw a dramatic decline in cancer screening of all types. So we probably, for example, mammography for breast cancer screening was down 95% at one point in early 2020. Uh, you know, some of that uh, national, the, the rates of screening have largely recovered in the United States, but we believe we missed on the order of 10 million screening events uh, during the pandemic, and, and the, we just don't as a nation have the capacity to fully make up all those missed tests. So I think it's incumbent now on everyone interested in cancer progress and cancer care to try and get the word out to patients that they need to get in for missed screenings, that symptoms of cancer should not be ignored, but you know patients need to start returning to their doctors. By the way, in addition to reduced screening during the pandemic, we also saw a reduction in cancer diagnoses, meaning patients uh, presenting with cancer to physicians on the order of 50%. There's no reason to believe the incidence of cancer declined that much. We think those cancers are eventually just gonna be diagnosed later at more advanced stage. And so this is really, we believe, kind of almost an emergency from a public health point of view to get patients back into usual care and to find these patients so that we don't trade the public health emergency of the pandemic for a different public health emergency of delayed cancer diagnosis in the future. So one last question. You mentioned at the beginning, this is 50 years. Uh, we're coming up with the 50th anniversary of the. National Cancer Act, probably not super surprising that science has advanced a lot since the Nixon administration, uh, but I, I want you to sort of take us ahead to the 100th anniversary in another 50 years. Well, Where is know, it realistic? The Act, we're gonna... it, yeah, and the National Cancer Act in many ways was visionary. You know, it had this, this goal of using science and, 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 and public health measures to try and address cancer, but it was also very naive. It thought we were going to cure cancer within like five years after the National Cancer Act. And cancer tried to be a much harder problem than that. But I, you know, I think what's different today from 1971 is that we understand cancer. We know what we don't know. Back then, we did not know what we did not know. 
So that 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 advance in our understanding of biology of cancer really makes power makes possible many many future advances. And so I think that we'll continue to see progress, uh, you know, against you know specific types of cancer. So little subsets of cancer, uh, with you know, but in aggregate, all of that progress against individual niches adds up to great progress overall. And that's what I think we can count on seeing uh, in terms of prevention and screening and treatments and all of these measures in aggregate will reduce cancer mort mortality. Uh, for, for years to come. And so I think we will look back on this period as a golden age of cancer progress because of all that work. Okay. Um, well, let's leave it on that optimistic note. Uh, thank you so much for your time. Uh, we really appreciate it. It's great to hear from you. Thank you so much for having me today. And thank you for joining us today for another virtual event that has made everyone smarter, faster. I hope you found this conversation enlightening. And if you did, I encourage you to check out Axios Vitals, our daily healthcare newsletter. You can subscribe at axios.com newsletters. Thanks again, and we'll see you on axios.com.